Today on Aspiring Women. Astronaut James Irwin took his wife Mary to the moon and back. Hear their story of love, heartache, and hope. Hello, welcome to Aspiring Women. We're going to talk about heroes today. And who are our heroes? Mm. Firemen, policemen, mm-hmm. teachers, soldiers. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Oh, soldiers. All the underpaid people. The people that take care of us. Yeah, when, the servants. Yeah, and, and they are underpaid. <laughs> they really, really are. You know, a frustration I have is that I raised three daughters, teenagers, well, actually mm-hmm. four teenagers, three of them girls, but they look at Hollywood and they say, those are the heroes. Oh. Those, And that is so frustrating yeah, to me. It is. Because there's, what are what are they sacrificing? Nothing. They and doing? do we romanticize the um, right heroes? I think we do romanticize people, sure. and then it's kind of hard to live up to that. And especially if you're the spouse or the yeah. family, what's the well, fallout on them? Well, they sacrifice. Well, they yeah. I they mean, sacrifice a lot. I think of women that their husbands are police officers mm-hmm. or vice soldiers, versa, and they go off husbands, to war. Yeah. Well, husbands who even wives look at are, Billy Graham. You know, Ruth yeah. Graham said she raised the kids by themselves, and we certainly hold sure. Billy Graham up on a pedestal. But there's yeah. fallout to the family. Mm-hmm. Or of but, course, even like a Martin Luther King, where you ultimately mm-hmm. sacrifice the life of your husband oh, and your father. That's, that's so true. Heroes are so important, though. Don't you think we need them? We do need them. We, we do. need to have the vision for something that aspires us. And yes. our children, I think little children need heroes very, very well, much. They teach us how to live. They and do. that's why it's so important to pick the right ones, because we don't want to focus on the wrong person and, and copy them when it, they're the wrong person. They mm-hmm. set the standard for laying mm-hmm. the foundation for our future, our history, and our destiny, ultimately. That's good. Well, today, we have uh, a great story about another hero. Colonel James Irwin was the eighth man to walk on the moon with the Apollo 15 mission, but his dream of becoming an astronaut would take a toll on his family and his wife, Mary. Here's their story. Ignition sequence start. Engines on. Well, being married to an astronaut surely really isn't all that it's cracked up to be. The the public sees it one way. The reality is quite something else. You spend a lot of time alone. How many children did you have? Uh, Four at the time. And... uh, Basically, you're raising them alone. It was hard on the children because they looked to mom all week long as being the one that said yes or no, we could do this, we can't do this, we're going to do this, we're not going to do this, or whatever. And then turning that over to Jim when he was home on the weekend was difficult for the children. I had to make a concerted effort to say, ask your dad. The wives were in the public eye as well. Yes, ma'am, they were. Were there high expectations of you? We realized that, Um, especially during a flight. They were just unmercifully scrutinized. The the media would park out in your front lawn or the neighbors. At one point, uh, I remember one of the photographers showed my son, who was probably eight at the time, how to operate the camera, put it on his neck, and told him to go and take pictures of the inside of the house of his mom. Well, I'm afraid I marched him right back outside with that camera. And you're not doing that, you know. So um, there was not really any privacy. It wasn't reality. The challenges you faced as Jim Irwin's wife kind of came to a head. What was going on in your life at that time? I had been raised in a a very strict religious atmosphere as a child growing up and went to their uh, schools and so forth and so I was very very steeped in this and to try to go with the flow basically was difficult for me I never felt really a part of were you looking for somebody to help you give you some guidance because you were struggling absolutely absolutely I didn't find it in church I certainly didn't have it at home Jim was gone all the time Um, I I had nowhere else to turn, and and in foolishness, I turned to an astrologer. Were you disappointed, or did it help you? 
no, it was it didn't help. It only made things worse because she thought there was going to be a fire in the spacecraft. And here I'm telling my husband this, and he's about thump me one because don't be telling me this kind of stuff. What do you expect them to tear the spacecraft apart and look for a wire? So it was, you know, it wasn't really reality. I have often thought how it must feel when the astronaut's wife is sitting in there watching that countdown. Can you just describe for us what was going through your mind? You had to be scared. No. No? <laughs> I would have been terrified. No. I didn't have any fear because I had tremendous faith in the Lord. I remember very, very clearly the first night he was on the moon. I had to kneel down um, by the window in the bedroom and looking up over a fence, I could see the moon, and I just remember saying, thank you, God, for bringing him home safely. Now, you mentioned you had kind of gotten off into astrology. Mm -hmm. You were struggling with the whole mm -hmm. religion thing, mm -hmm. and yet you had a relationship with the Lord. When did that mm -hmm. happen? Well, I'd always known God from, a, from the moment I was born. I knew God. But uh, it's easy to to fall away, surely, or, or move away from the closeness to God when you get out in the world. And I, I had a goal in mind. And um, when I met Jim Irwin, he brought that goal to a screeching halt. What was your goal? Oh, I wanted to go to Paris and model. And I was preparing to, to, um, to get into the Miss California contest. I had my clothes ready and so forth. And yes, he, he, he brought things right to a screeching halt. <laughs> was it better than Paris? <laughs> 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 okay, um, in a different way, yes. Yes. That was so sneaky. Of me. <laughs> in a different way, yes. Well, I love her. I had so much fun interviewing her. She's a kick. Yeah, it looked like but fun. It was. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she did, after all, make the choice. She said he made everything come to a screeching halt. But she chose to marry him. But, you know, we really did hold those NASA people on a pedestal. I had the uh, opportunity to work for NASA right out of college. It was my first job out of college. And, and it was so much fun. But, you know, these engineers, these aerospace engineers, it's well, heady stuff, you yeah, know. But and you so, know what? The other thing, too, though, is the myth of what women look for. They want the rich man. They want the powerful yeah, she man. she made the choice. But you make a sacrifice for those kind of men because they're off being powerful and, and making money. <laughs> That's so sure. not powerful. If you can hang out until they retire, then fine. That's you know, right. but you got to know the reality of what you might have to expect. Well, but that's that is true. But but when you're 19 or 20 years mm, old, how true. do you ever know uh, that? Well, I'm telling you, young ladies. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, Mary tells us about Jim's divine encounter on the moon. But his lunar mission would come with a price. They have a water tube inside the spacesuit. The tube kinked. So he did not have any water all day long. Jim reached his dreams by walking on the moon, but his great achievements put his health at risk. Here's more from Mary. I had been praying for years. God, join us together where you want us. I was not a part of the space program. My head doesn't work like that. And I just wanted God to put us together. Wherever it was, whatever he wanted us to do, put us together. And so when he returned from the moon, he had had such an encounter with God on the moon. He felt that if, if he turned around, he'd see him standing there. That's how close God was. He was there in a very dramatic way for me. He was there to answer prayer, to guide us to the discovery of that white rock, the Genesis rock, to inspire me to quote a scripture, which I had never done before in my life. And so I know that uh, he was there in a, in a very direct way, even though I could not see him. I just sensed his presence. From that point on, he knew. He had been a Christian since the time he was a child, but he knew there was a creator, there was one in control, and he had to come back and was compelled to share. Jesus Christ with the world. I think God has a plan for each one of us here on the blue planet. It took me a long while to realize what his plan was for my life, but I'm sure that he has a plan for your life. And I just wonder what God's plan will be for you. Now he was in ministry full time for 20 years before his health began to fail. What happened? Well, to his him? health, sweetie, it really started on the moon. Really? Yes because they had to get there before it got too hot. I think it was, what is it, plus 250 degrees Fahrenheit? It's very hot. 
or at nighttime minus that. So they had to be there at a certain time to protect themselves. And uh, he did not select enough cooling in the liquid cooled underwear and his um, tube, they have a water tube inside the spacesuit, the tube kinked. So he did not have any water all day long doing the, all the experiments and how hot it was. And he perspired so intensely that when they got back into the spacecraft, he literally poured perspiration out of his boots and his gloves. So he had lost a lot of electrolytes and that's dangerous. That can trigger a heart attack. And from that point on, Jim had problems with his heart. And it wasn't more than a year later they had his first heart attack here. Tell us about Jim's death. Well, he had had that heart attack and then he had bypass surgery. And about six weeks or two months later after bypass, he was in the mountains skiing with the children. He had a heart attack while skiing. Then in 1982, he had a heart arrest where he all but died at that point. And so when the doctor came to me and said, I can't give you any hope, I said, he's gonna be all right. God has already spoken to me. And they watched a miracle after miracle take place because he was on a respirator. And then his death, even though he had had these problems, his death was sudden. And yet you felt that it brought closure. I didn't believe it. I just thought he had another heart attack. And I said, so, okay, where is he this time? He was with friends who had CPR, he was with doctors, he was with uh, anyone and everyone that could have done whatever. And they worked for two hours on him, which is very rare. It's like a finality, it, okay, it finally happened. It wasn't that it was easy. Trust me, it was not. But when all my children came, I remember standing in the hallway with my kids, our arms entwined, and said, God, my kids don't have a dad. I'm a widow, you said you'd be a husband to me. I'm expecting you to take over where Jim left off. And surely God's faithful, he did. You know, none of us really ever knew that that happened. At least I don't remember as a young person knowing that that happened on the moon to him. Oh. But when he came home, he had been so close to God that he had to tell people about Jesus. And he actually started a ministry called High Flight mm -hmm. and traveled around speaking. And um, she was gone again. Again. Which was right. very hard for her because she was hoping that it would be something that would bring them together, that they could do together. But like she said, she couldn't identify with NASA and neither can I. So I could see why she was frustrated with that. Mm -hmm. But now he has a ministry, but still it took him away from his family. It did. And she actually uh, told us that, uh, you know, she, she was asked to step right in uh, after he died and, and kind of take over. And she really didn't have time to grieve. Mm -hmm. And so, nor did she wanted to do that. You know, right. taking, she, different, she had different goals. She had different goals. Again, she had different goals and wanting to say, you know, who am I as a mm -hmm. woman? Um, is this really what I've been called to do? And it was really a frustrating time for and, her. And, you know, especially when you're dealing with something like ministry, you need to know you were called or it, it, is, it would be labor as opposed to a labor it, of love. Well, that's mm -hmm. so true. It's like work if you're not. But uh, oftentimes, you know, spouses have, you know, different. have different goals. And, and that's different okay. Directions. People but need to know that. That's that's, okay. that's true, but she said I, I kept, we kept trying to find something we had in common. Uh -huh. And unfortunately, some uh, marriages, they never do really find anything. Well, how do you get together, though? That's always interesting yeah, to it, me. Yeah. It's like, yeah, how do you right. end up getting married right. if, if you're fighting to find things in common? That's right. Mm -hmm. While Mary struggled to rebuild her life, little did she know God was working on her heart. I felt like a little rowboat in a typhoon. And so one night by my bed, I was praying and just asking God, what are you doing with my life? Mary was ready to move on with her life when love unexpectedly entered the picture again. Here's more. During that time of recovery and healing for you, God gave you a vision and a promise. What did he tell you? One night by my bed, I was praying and just asking God, what are you doing with my life? I have to know. I need direction. I have nothing. And, and he spoke to me and said, I'm preparing you for another and gave me a vision of this man. And that kind of blew me away. 
because I didn't want to get married again. I thought, wow, once around a block was enough for me. I said, okay, if that's the case, what's on the agenda here? What do we have to do? And so boom, 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 one, two, three, four, he started. What were some of those things you okay, had to The do? number one thing he had me to do was to go close the door where Jim had died. I needed to go back to that place. And I realized it, that I didn't know who I was. Uh, and to come to that point to find out you lost your identity is kind of scary. So I'd gone back to my old modeling photographs. I pulled one out, put it in the frame, put it on the desk, and said, okay, God, I don't know who she is, but help me get in touch with her again. I need to know who she is. Because from that time, the, the vision, it was seven years before I met this man. How did God change your mind? Well, when I had that vision, that guy was sure good looking. <laughs> That did it for you, right? <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> How did you meet Ron? What, what caught your eye about him? A friend had uh, invited him to come to the big band dance, where they played the oldies, the 30s, the 40s music. Okay. And he, he was never going to get involved again. Never. And uh, so he wasn't looking for a wife either? Absolutely not. No. Nope. And so I was talking to this friend, and I said, you know, shall I invite him for dinner? Sure, why not? You have nothing to do with us. Yeah, yeah, this is very scary. I don't do this. I don't do the dating. I've been married 33 years to Jim. And he came to dinner. And the rest was history. Eight months into your marriage with Ron, mm -hmm. you went ballroom dancing again. Same place you had met Ron originally. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that night. We had planned to go that evening. And um, in my spirit, I said, Ron, something's wrong. And so uh, we did get dressed, went on to the dance, had a wonderful night. Yeah, I'm telling you, he, he was, his eyes were dancing all night long. Standing right next to me, watch, waiting for the band to strike up the last day of the song, and down on the floor he goes. And I think, oh man, I've worn out his knees dancing him to death all night long. And so I was right on the floor beside him. I said, you're all right, he's not talking to me. All of a sudden I thought, Oh my gosh, it's happening again. So I start mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. And uh, the gentleman that, one of the gentlemen that played in the, in the orchestra, his wife was there too. She's standing right beside me and she began to pray. And the prayer warriors were just around me, began to pray and intercede. And uh, they started doing CPR on him. Somebody called uh, the ambulance. I just, I was in shock. I could not believe this was happening to me a second time. What do you think God is calling you to today? God had other things for me to do. And one of those things, surely, is to encourage those who have lost loved ones. Because it's tough. Was it easy for me? Absolutely not. Through my tears, day in and day out, hour in and hour out, I was always in tears. And God would speak to me and say, the best is yet to come. I said, yeah, I know glory's on the other side, but in my heart I knew that's not what he was talking about. He, had, he has other things for me. The best is yet to come. Well, they certainly were in love. Oh, yeah. she loved Ron so much. In fact, yeah. she told me that uh, her first husband was the father of her children, all her children, but Ron was her soulmate. Mm -hmm. And I asked her about having your soulmate for only eight months, being married to one another, and she said, you know, sometimes I think that God took him because I would have loved him too much. There just mm -hmm. would have been too much and uh, that I needed to release him. And yeah, she said, actually, that if, if she had been able to be married to him for like many years. She doesn't think she could have handled yeah, it. Yeah, wow. yeah. Wow. It's very beautiful. They really did have a love story, mm -hmm. a real loving relationship. She really did connect with her soulmate. But, um, you know, it's just... Well, you think we have soulmates? Oh. <laughs> do I think we have soulmates? Yes, I do. I, I think, think we so. do. You know, but it's interesting. Mary said God, that she thought God orchestrated it, her falling in love with Ron and then and then his death. And, and our first reaction is, why? Why would God 
yeah. you're this perfect man and then take mm-hmm. him away. But she feels that, you know, that she's, she's, she's at peace with that. To give her a picture, though, of her heart's desire, she always had a heart desire to be intimately connected That's with true. her husband. That's Ever true. since she was a young girl, mm-hmm. she My told God gave her someone who could fulfill that. did give that to her. And, you know, if they hadn't been married, she probably would have always had this what if mm-hmm. thing that was in her life. Well, I'm always clued into numbers, too. And it was seven years between the two husbands, and seven is the number of completion, and eight is the number of new beginnings. Interesting. And God gives us many new beginnings. We'll be back with some final thoughts. We're hearing a wonderful story about a woman that was married to an astronaut, Mary. She um, and her husband, both of her husbands, ending up dying and being a widow once again. And how she's taking this experience of being a widow and uh, pouring it into the lives of women who have experienced loss, all kinds of loss and mm. brokenness. She does weekend retreats for women and things like that. She's very busy and very active. And, and you know what? She's happy. Yeah, mm. she is. And she talks about how women need to get in touch with who they are. That's that is who crucial. God called them to be, apart from being married or not being married or being a widow or not being a widow, but who are they? Who has God called them to that, be? That is so important mm-hmm. because a lot of women, you know, they're, they're like, what do I really want to be when I grow up and now I'm old? I mean, you know, I could mm-hmm. kind of relate to that a little bit because I really believe I kind of came into my own identity around 50 years old, you right. know, after my kids were gone and everything. And I was always married to a CEO, married to a minister, you know, and that was great. I, I don't regret anything in my life, but sometimes I didn't really know who I was. Isn't it great though? You and get seasons of your life. Yes. Yeah. You get to do different things. And she certainly is a picture of someone that did this. And then she was able to influence here and then eventually influence where she's at. Well, I think one of the greatest gifts God can give us is for us to look in the mirror and say, I know who I am and I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, first we're important. a woman created by God for a specific purpose that God has designed for our lives. And everything else is the frosting on the cake. But that's who we are first. That's true. That's true, Michelle. Well, Oswald Chambers once said, one of the most shallow, petty things we can tell a person is every cloud has a silver lining. He says there are some clouds that are black all the way through. Mary is fine today. You know, she's happy. She has a ministry. But none of us would have chosen to go through the storms that that woman has walked through. But just remember, you can always trust God. And on the other side of the dark clouds, there really is sunshine or maybe a gorgeous full moon. We'll see you next time.